it is the post-lunch session, but hopefully I can get you as excited about on-chain data as I get excited about on-chain data, because it really is, for me, the key way we can understand our industry. Imagine for those of you who work in crypto every day, it's still a really confusing space. You know, like, how do you keep up with what's going on? You have to check Twitter, probably scrolling through for 30 minutes a day. You're probably in 10 different WhatsApp groups or 20 different Telegram channels. Although, luckily, there's only one newsletter that you have to subscribe to. It's the Chainalysis one. But you know, it is a confusing space, and that's strange because we have a single source of truth, the blockchain. All of the transactions that happen in our industry, you know, they're recorded there. And we can analyze that and find out what's going on. And so today, I'm going to tell you really three stories of how we can use on-chain data to understand our industry. I'm going to start with where and how cryptocurrency is actually used. I'm then going to talk about how we can use on-chain data to understand whether trading volumes are true or perhaps whether they're being faked. And then finally, I'm going to explain how we can use on-chain data to understand whether markets are being manipulated. So where and how is Bitcoin used? Well, Bitcoin is used all over the world. It really is a truly global currency. But we were able to go a bit better than that very broad statement and we were able to you know, do time zone analysis and look at open source intelligence and various bits of methodology you can ask me about you know, at the bar later on. And we were able to identify where about $450 billion worth of Bitcoin transactions had originated from since you know, 2009, so the really beginning of Bitcoin up to today. And we found some really interesting regional trends. By far, the major area was Asia with about half of that $450 billion uh, worth of Bitcoin originating in that region. We were able to split out a couple of those uh, countries, seeing you know, China really being the largest individual country uh, for Bitcoin transactions. But then also a lot of activity in Japan and Korea. But what surprised me was that Korea actually seemed to have more Bitcoin coming out of it than Japan did. You know, so those markets are always in quite close rivalry. But actually, it's really interesting to see you know, Korea has about $40 billion worth of Bitcoin uh, being sent from that region versus 23 in Japan. But you know, it's not all about Asia. There is, of course, a lot of activity in North America and in Europe. And while this is a blank area in Africa and the Middle East, I should emphasize that's not because there's no cryptocurrency activity happening there. It's just given the big data approach we took, we weren't able to get sufficient analysis there. But we do know there is quite a lot of activity happening in Africa, say, you know, in Kenya, Uganda, and Nigeria. But also, interestingly, you know, a real hotspot local market in South Africa, another hotspot market up in Turkey. These markets with you know, low billions of dollars worth of Bitcoin being sent, but still substantial. And then, of course, we've still got South America and Russia, you know, seeing tens of billions of dollars being sent out of them. So cryptocurrency, it really is a global you know, payment system, a way of transferring value. But the majority of the activity is originating from Asia. That's where cryptocurrency is being used. But you know, how is it being used? And what we're showing you here is all of the activity that flows between the different types of services. And you can see here that exchanges, they really are the vast majority of activity on the blockchain, taking up to about half when we calculate this in Bitcoin terms since 2009. And what's fascinating for me is just how much of that value flowing from exchanges is going to other exchanges. It's really showing you that you know, the cryptocurrency economy is about value flows from exchanges to exchanges. Speculation really is still the key use. But we can also see, I guess, why chain analysis is important. Because we've got here the red and the pink. That is darknet markets and illicit activity. And we can see, for example, the red flowing into the blue. So that's darknet markets sending to exchanges. Uh, and then, indeed, we've got the blue going back to the red. 
where the exchanges are then sending funds into the darknet markets. I should say, for those of you who think that's a pretty big slice of this circle, remember this is in Bitcoin terms. If this was in dollar terms, it would be much smaller. Much of the activity going through darknet markets you know, was earlier in Bitcoin's history when prices were lower. And indeed, if we were looking at this in dollar terms in 2009, sorry, 2019, it'd be about 1% of this circle. But it's not all speculation and crime. It's also worth saying, look, there's this you know, mint colored area there. Uh, that's, for example, mining pools sending their Bitcoin to exchanges to cash out, and also includes merchant services, which have been growing year after year. So the majority of you know, activity and Bitcoin, it really is on exchanges. But what happens if we bring these two insights together, We're looking at the geography of activity and then the fact that so much of that activity is happening on exchanges? Well, we can look now at the flow of Bitcoin between different exchanges mapped according to their country of main market. So what we're showing you here are the 100 largest bilateral net flows. Now, what a bilateral net flow is, is if I send you $100 and you send me $30, then there's a $70 net flow from me to you. And we've just taken the 100 largest net flows between exchanges in the last year. And we see some fascinating trends. In the blues, we've got exchanges that tend to serve you know, Asian customers. And we can see that they're really highly interconnected. And that's quite different from the exchanges you know, in, say, North America and Europe in the sort of yellows on this side. They're not as tightly interconnected as those Asian exchanges. However, there are hub exchanges in each region that do connect the cryptocurrency ecosystem together. So overall, we find that the majority of on-chain activity, you know, it's in exchanges, and in particular, it's in Asian exchanges. But it's also important to realize that there are flows between these key hub exchanges. We can now turn to verifying trade volumes. And this is a big issue. There's a lot of headlines about the fact that you can't really trust some of the data that's coming out of exchanges. And this is you know, detrimental to the industry. If you're a retail customer, you don't know where to go and trade. If you're a big financial institution, and all the stories you hear are about you know, the data coming out of these exchanges, I'm not sure I can trust it. It means that people aren't going to allow cryptocurrency to become mainstream. But what we're talking about are you know, uncertainty around the trade volumes. So that's the number of Bitcoin that exchanges you know, buy and sell on their centralized order books. But we have this other source of data, and that's the on-chain volume. That's the number of Bitcoin actually moved on the blockchain to exchanges. That's what you see in Reactor, for example. And the key insight is that trade volumes, well, they're cheap to fake, whereas on-chain volumes are expensive to fake because you actually have to own the Bitcoin before you can move it across the blockchain. So how can we use these trade volumes and these on-chain volumes to try and understand, you know, how reliable the trading volumes are. Well, we can take a benchmark. There's the Bitwise 10. Uh, so 10 exchanges identified by you know, Bitwise and I think widely accepted by the industry as having accurate volumes. And what's interesting is we can look at their trading volume and their on-chain volume. So here in the orange, we've got the number of Bitcoin traded per week on the Bitwise 10. It's currently around 1.3 million Bitcoin traded per week. And the blue line, we've got the number of Bitcoin that they received on-chain, which currently is around 213,000 per week. And of course, we can divide the orange line by the blue line to get a ratio for how many Bitcoin are traded for every single one that they receive on-chain. And obviously, it goes up and down. But on average in 2019, there were six Bitcoin traded for every one Bitcoin the Bitwise 10 received on-chain. So that's kind of interesting, right? We've got a benchmark. But it's weird. The Bitwise 10, they're not in the largest Bitcoin markets, say, if you go to a site like CoinMarketCap. Now, obviously, there's something like BitMEX at the top because it's a derivatives exchange. So you know, its volumes are very different. 
But you know, the rest of this top five, they're not ones I'm too familiar with, but we can go and look at the data. And in fact, if we you know, pick an example from that top 10, you know, an exchange called Bitforex, well, it's currently trading many more Bitcoin than the Bitcoin it receives on chain. In fact, in this case, you know, really in September, it's been ramping up quite a lot to around 40,000 Bitcoin traded for every one that it received on chain. And given that we've got six on our sort of benchmark set of the Bitwise 10, this is where we can use on-chain data to perhaps question whether the data you know, is accurate there. You know, and it's not just us. You know, for example, CoinMarketCap would also uh, recently released a thing called their liquidity metric, which is 800 times smaller than uh, Bitforex's trading volume. So here, we can actually use that data to understand that there perhaps is some fake volumes. But it's not all a story of fake volumes. And in fact, for me, this is the most interesting thing about this investigation that we did. We looked at exchanges that had large on-chain volumes. So they were also receiving you know, good amounts of Bitcoin, similar levels to the Bitwise 10. And what we see is, you know, in orange, we've got that Bitwise 10 ratio that on average is six Bitcoin received for every, sorry, six Bitcoin traded for every one received. And then the blue line, we've got the ratio for these additional 12 that we looked at. And if you look in 2018, you know, they're out of sync. And indeed, there's a, a period in late 2018 when the ratio for these additional 12 is much higher. So suggesting there are perhaps suspicious levels of trading activity given how much Bitcoin is coming into these exchanges on chain. And indeed, that is a you know, publicly acknowledged period of time that there was, for example, a lot of competition among Korean exchanges and you know, suspicion of uh, faked volumes. But perhaps because there's been such an outcry in the industry, in 2019, these ratios, they've now already got into sync. So that suggests that these additional 12 exchanges have perhaps you know, cleaned up their act. And actually, they have you know, the same level of real volume as the Bitwise 10. And we can look at these additional 12 exchanges, and it tells us an interesting picture. You know, some of them are, are smaller, they're more international, and indeed, there's quite a number from Asia, where you know, a lot of the doubts or suspicions around trading volume had come from. And this is important to understand, because those additional 12 exchanges, they receive you know, the equivalent of 50% of the amount of Bitcoin that the Bitwise 10 receive. So if you're you know, only really relying on this small set of exchanges that you think you can trust, you're missing out on an awful lot of liquidity. Whereas actually you realize there's some real volume happening on these exchanges, there's a bigger market. And what's even better is, you know, over time, not only will this volume be real, but we can also check that it's safe volume. Still work to be done there, but as more and more exchanges adopt compliance tools, such as KYT, you know, we'll get to understand, look, big, liquid, real, safe markets for Bitcoin. And that, for me, is one of the key insights of on-chain volume, that we can use it to verify whether these trading volumes are accurate, and therefore, we can proceed with a bit more confidence and engage in you know, more liquid, deeper markets. But we can also get some market insights from this data. And so, you know, putting back the bitwise 10 ratio there again, it obviously moves up and down over time, but actually moves with the price. So as the price goes down, that ratio decreases. And that makes sense. When you know, markets aren't quite as exciting, People aren't trading as much for all the Bitcoin that's coming in on chain. But as the price starts to rise up, we see that ratio you know, increases, that intensity increases. People are trading more, even though there isn't as much coming in on chain. And actually, a really nice thing with this data is uh, the very last week was uh, when Xi Jinping announced that China was now going to go full on on blockchain. And you can really see this big uh, jump in that ratio. And really, for me, that suggests that that announcement was a surprise because people weren't ready with their Bitcoin on the exchanges. And so people just kind of went into a bit of a trading frenzy and the liquidity wasn't there. But we can get another really interesting insight. What we're looking at here 
is a week-on-week -week percentage change in the number of Bitcoin traded and the number of Bitcoin moving on-chain. And so a week-on-week -week percentage change is if there's 100 Bitcoin being traded in this week and 150 being traded next week, there'll be a 50% week-on-week -week percentage change. And what's fascinating is that the on-chain increases in the blue lines are a week ahead of the trading volume on the exchanges. So we're really seeing Bitcoin move onto the exchange and you know, with a lag after, there being a response in the amount of trading activity that happens. And perhaps you know, that's obvious, you have to have the Bitcoin there before you can trade it. But the fact that the data shows this so clearly can help us actually you know, perhaps predict what might be happening and to understand current market conditions. Talking of current market conditions, we can also use this data to understand market manipulation. It's you know, a pretty hot topic at the moment. So to start, well, the price of Bitcoin is volatile, which I guess is the kind of insight that makes you chief economist. Um, <laughs> but more seriously, price, you know, Bitcoin price is volatile. Um, you know, out of the last year, uh, the price has gone up on about half of days, and it's gone down on about half of days. So we expect a certain amount of price volatility. But there's sometimes that this volatility just gets a bit suspicious. And we've got a case study for you of around the 3rd and 4th of June this year, where a set of exchanges received, sorry, um, where we saw a very large decrease in uh, the Bitcoin price in a short period of time, in about an hour and a half. And in that period of time, uh, a set of exchanges expect, you know, uh, experience a very high amount of Bitcoin flowing into the exchange. And you can see that spike here. So there's about 10,000 Bitcoin arriving at these exchanges you know, in a number of you know, hours, really about two hours. And given that the entire Bitwise 10 gets about 213,000 Bitcoin a week, to get 10,000 in an hour and a half, that's a very big inflow. And this is just on you know, a subset of those exchanges. And what's, you know, for me fascinating and what I love about working at Chainalysis is, is not only that I can take this big picture view, but we can also then dive into Reactor and see actually those 10,000 Bitcoin, they came from just two clusters. So we can dive into that micro view. And, you know, this Bitcoin was transferred within an hour of each other. So it looks like there's you know, something interesting going on here. And indeed, the Bitcoin was then promptly sold. Uh, and you can see there this big wave of sell orders uh, and the price you know, really falling quite significantly with a reduction of about 10% by the end of the 4th of June. Now, you could just say, look, that's some people that want to sell some Bitcoin in a hurry. That's fine. But the thing that makes this really interesting for me is that at the same time, there was a very large short position taken against Bitcoin on BitMEX, a big derivatives exchange. Uh, and you can really see that here. We've just uh, taken the buy uh, orders and taken the sell orders, uh, subtracted the sell orders from that. So you can see this really large net uh, bet against the Bitcoin price as the Bitcoin price is falling. Perhaps the thing that makes this even more interesting is we can even see that later in the day, a very large amount of Bitcoin was withdrawn from BitMEX, suggesting that some people had done quite well out of that trade. And they were then taking their funds or their Bitcoin off of the exchange uh, into their own personal wallets. So on-chain data, it really helps us separate you know, suspicious activity from normal market volatility. And indeed, we've worked with a couple of exchanges so far to see how we can use on-chain data to help them understand their market integrity. And indeed, if you're interested, please come talk to me, or you can get in touch via markets at chainalysis.com. And so hopefully I've kind of given you a bit of a story and journey through on-chain data and why I think it really is so fascinating. And for the rest of you, it's time to wake up because we've got a great new panel on uh, working with global regulators. Thank you.